Our Thursdays start with cane corns. Cane, hello. Hello, Jared. Kyrios, tantrum, or <laughs> finally proof that he cares? Can it be both? It probably uh, but, can. Yeah, I think it's both. I think it's uh, absolutely both. Um, it was an awful display of sportsmanship, and if it was anyone other than an Australian, there'd be no one giving them a get-out pass. So imagine if Serena had done that after a game against Ash Barty at the Australian Open. The criticism coming Serena's way, and um, even though she's the greatest ever, would be would be fierce. So I think he's got off a little bit lightly for his carry-on after that game, and that is systematic of the issues with Nick. He's... I just don't think he's a nice person with the way that he treats people, um, the way that he treats his own people, the way that he treats his opponents, the way that he treats spectators. Um, uh, sometimes he says the right things, but doesn't act in the way that he's, is authentic. So I don't personally warm to him as a person, and I don't think he's a nice person. But I think his comments after the game um, show that he cares, or at least he's talking for the first time that he cares. Now it is up to him um, to do the work um, to get to the point where he can win a Grand Slam because he's still a long way from being in that position over seven games for two weeks. The mental demons that you've got to fight, um, the the ferocity of your opponents up the other end that have hit for five hours in the offseason every day. Has Nick done that? Yeah, probably not. Those that do have a coach that have looked at the one percenters, the nuances, the strengths and weaknesses of the opposition, they've studied the tape. Has Nick done that? Well, probably not. So if he truly wants to win a Grand Slam, he has to do the work to get him in that position that he hasn't done. Uh, he needs a coach. He needs to be smarter with it, with his play, and he can't rely on just the talent that he's got, and he needs to work harder. And until he does that, he will never win a Grand Slam. He's 27 years of age now, so still got a lot of growing up to do, I think, Jared, What was your your take on it? Uh, yeah, I'm a little bit of both. I think all of the points you make there. I'm, I'm more intrigued with his tennis now than I have been for a long time. I emotionally checked out of him years ago because he wasn't engaged in his own endeavours, but he is now. I think we saw some of that across Wimbledon, and I think that's absolutely been there through this tournament. Um you have to, you, you ha as a person, you have to contain yourself better than that. At the end, that's a very public display, isn't it? If you feel mm -hmm. that way, that's the batter who goes back to the pavilion and heaves his bat against the wall uh, away from everybody's eyes. So you have to have a level of control in that. But I, I think the way that he talks now, he's he's got a sense of team rather than just the sense of self uh, and he has tried to lay it all out there where he used to just be prepared to throw it away. So mm. um, he's not going to be easy to be with. Um, <laughs> that yeah. that much is clear. And you, the, your observation about him as a person, that, that might be it. He's not going to be easy to be with. And I suspect I'll never give myself, my heart truly over to yep. it. I'm intrigued by it, though. Mm. Hey, congratulations on your induction into the South Australian Hall of Football Hall of Fame during the week. Um, and beautiful photos that, that with the family, but then particularly with Graham and the Chad <laughs> and you all. Meant, what, a, what an honour for the family to have all three of you as part of that esteemed collection. Thank you. That was the, that was the first thing I thought. I probably got the phone call 12 months ago, and for obvious reasons, this had been delayed. But the first thought was well how good to to join dad who is who is a legend of south australian football and i you know, i don't say that with a biased lens he, he genuinely is for his advocacy for the sample competition over such a long period of time as a player as a coach as a media commentator and his passion for south australian football um i don't think anyone you know has been as passionate about the cause as what he has and then um, you know, Chad, who I admired so greatly with the way that he played his football, a completely different person to me, but, um, you know, he was, you know, he was a top, probably one or two player in the game there for a couple of years there and, and laid it all on the line with his passion. So it was a thrill to play alongside of him and then to be inducted alongside those two uh, men who I've looked up to, you know, clearly and have just wanted to emulate what they have done gone about it in our different ways, but yeah, that was the overwhelming sense of pride, I guess, for the family to join those two in that group. Did you, so you're buried deep in your work at the moment and few work as ferociously as you do. Did it, did it give you a moment to reflect on, on what has been in a former life? Well, that was the best part of the night. I took two days off work. So thank you to Julian at work and, and everyone who gave me a couple of days off. We went and stayed in the city and it wasn't just me and the boys and Lucy. It was Lucy's parents stayed and my mum was there and 
dad was there and my sisters were there who I don't see very often. That was it for me. So I actually took footy classified off. So to those at Channel 9, you know, my appreciation is there. So I did actually get a time to relax and, and switch the mind off for a little bit. And it was magnificent. Uh, it was my son's 16th birthday the next day. So I went out for breakfast as well with everyone. So it was was terrific. And then the other aspect was I, I admired Matthew Pavlich so much because yep. he was the year above me at the same school. And I, I, I shared a story on the night that we're at St. Peter's College one day. I was in year nine. He was in year 10. And he was ripping St. Peter's apart. He kicked 14 on this day. And I was going from the golf square at one end to the golf square at the other end, just following Pav around. I thought, this, this is the best junior footballer I've ever seen. And then we you know, had a connection from our time together at school and played some junior footy together so to be inducted in in with him and his parents jan and steve have had a big influence on me as well uh, was was really special so the night was just was just perfect so i just want to thank all my teammates and coaches and the two magnificent football clubs that have you know that i belong to in the glenelg footy club and, and port adelaide obviously for for the night but yeah had a terrific time so thank you well done we don't quote Wayne Carey these days but <laughs> i think you'll have to review his port adelaide good player kane corns <laughs> Line, I yeah. think you will. Um, Kane Ross Lyon saw danger at Essendon. That that's not very comforting for others. So, what what were your, what are your observations having heard Ross's thoughts on classified last night? Yeah, I've got a bit of a different lens on this one as well, which might surprise you, might <laughs> not. I um, I think it's a good thing for Essendon. I think this is the process working. Uh, that, that's what I, that's what I think now. If he is not prepared to put himself all into the process, then I don't think he's the guy for Essendon. So I think actually the sounding out of him and the, I guess, putting him through what he was going to have to go through to win the job on his own merits has worked. Now, I don't, this is just an opinion, I don't think he was prepared to do that. I don't think he was prepared to go through an extensive process, multiple interviews, presentations, meeting with the selection panel and putting forward his case as to why he's the right coach for the Essendon Football Club. I feel like he just wanted to be given the job. Um, and you know, I don't think that's the right thing for the Bombers. So I think th there's a tier of coaches, isn't there, Kane, that would expect to be headhunted rather than yep. be put through the beauty pageant? Not many of those, though, is there? Not many in that tier. Who's in that tier? So Clarkson, yes, is... I don't know. Is it? Is it? Is it Ken, Ken Hinckley has to be in that. Well, he because you can't get him any other way. Correct. So th this is the the contradiction I think in what Essendon have set up is they said they wanted one of these tier of coaches, but this process can't land mm. that. They said they said that initially, and I wonder whether those comments from David Barham, I think it was at the time, you know, he would be regretful of that, and you're not going to probably hold it to someone just that admission at the time when a lot was going on the footy club. I think Josh Marnie since clarified those comments. I just think this is exactly what Essendon need. They need someone who is fully invested in being the best AFL head coach that they can be and doing it for those reasons, to get the best out of the playing group. Was Ross going to do it for those reasons or was it the you know, last roll at the dice of perhaps winning a premiership and, and coaching a big club? So, look... My outside lens on it, this is exactly the way that the process should be designed to work, and it, it is working. And if you're not fully invested in going through what it needs to take to get this job and not be given it, um, yeah, then I, I don't think it's a bad thing that he's pulled himself out of this race. Do you think Ross will ever get offered a job in such a way? Uh, you you would never say never. Um, you know, you would think you would think time is running out. For that, he said last night, if it's the right opportunity. But once again, the right opportunity for Ross, I feel like, is someone saying the job's yours. No, no process. Here it is. Here's the keys. Bring your people. Come in, and do as best a job as you can. And no doubt, he'd do a good job if he was fully invested. But for Essendon, with what they've been through, and perhaps not going through a proper process last time, I think this is the right way. I'm not going to be critical of them not handing the keys to Ross Lyon because you may miss the next Craig McRae or the next. You know, Alistair Clarkson in 2004, or the next Damien Hardwick when he was given the job at Richmond. They need to find the next one of those, I think, not just go, okay, he's done it before, then he can do it again. Yeah, so they're mining for the undiscovered gem at this stage, I think. Yeah, yeah. And I, I liked and I liked your comments last night on 360, and you, you basically said all of that, that this process isn't designed to get one of those top tier of coaches. So you're right, they'll be out there. I, 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 I like what... 
Port Adelaide have, have been speculated at doing with Josh Carr, the report from Damian Barrett saying that Port Adelaide are headhunting Josh Carr to perhaps take over from Ken Hinckley at the end of next season. So I sort of like that process as well. Let's get the next one. Let's not go back and get someone who's been there before. Let's let's find the next Craig McRae. Um, and they're out there. So if, if Josh Carr comes in, Kane, what, what does that do to, like, you have to have the absolute buy-in of Ken, don't you, who has yeah. stated that he wants, he, he's going to fight for his job and he doesn't see the end points 2023. So I'll be interested in, into the Port Adelaide language. So is that the language or is it just Josh Carr has been appointed as a senior assistant coach? That, that's what I think they'll say. Um, it, but Ken has said that he's doing the best thing for the Port Adelaide Football Club and he, he's often said that. I, I think he would take a bit of pride in developing the next coach of, of the footy club, but you'd have to swallow a bit of your pride, wouldn't you, to be able to do that. So we'll wait and see whether Josh Carr firstly comes and then how Port Adelaide spin the appointment. Thursday last week... The fateful intervention of the Ark. There's plenty of Richmond supporters <laughs> who aren't over that on the 40 Wings temper texts. I'm not sure the club itself is. The club itself definitely isn't. Um, and, and what you're hearing from the AFL is they, they can't believe the, the carry-on from the Richmond Football Club over this. And, and in particular, Damien Harbick as well. And I, I think you've got to be a little bit careful. In fact, it's gone past being a little bit careful um, the complaints that have come from Richmond over a long period of time is now getting to the point where you, you are just a flat-out whinger. So if you look at some of the things that they've complained about, um, complained about Sydney's defensive tactics in a 2020 game, um, and then Damien Hardwick since came out and said he had a shocker on his behalf and wanted to apologise to John Longmire, which he did. Complain about dew on the ground, of all things, and being too much dew on the ground. Complain about Marvel Stadium, hate going there. Uh, abused a VFL player this year, uh, admitted to overstepping the mark. Complained about the close contact rule regarding Sydney Stack when we're in the height of the pandemic. Complained about the late umpiring call in the round 11 game against Sydney this year. Um, and have complained for a week about a, a goal review, which was the wrong process, right? We all get that, but... It was probably the right call. Like if you if you look at it, probably he missed the missed the goal. And then Tom Lynch's reaction was um, was you know reflective of that. So perhaps this is why Brendan Gale isn't the automatic replacement for Gillian McLaughlin as CEO because he hasn't been able to um, control Damien Hardwick and that issue. Perhaps the AFL are going well. This guy's done everything. He's perfect to take over from Gill. Why isn't he just the automatic? CEO of the AFL, well, perhaps the AFL are going, well, he hasn't been able to control Damien Hardwick and his constant whinging and constant complaining and, and petulance, really. This is this is to the point of petulance. So um, not a great, probably, reflection on, on, on Damien and the CEO, Brendan Gale. When you look at, you know, one other tactic could have, could have won them the game. Just put someone on Lockie Neal. Just give him some respect. Just one of the five defenders in the goal square. Just spoil the ball over the line. Don't concede... 16 goals in a final. Uh, and, yeah, so I think there's other areas that they should be focusing their attention on, not not a goal review. When, when, awesome the game. when there is such a departure from accepted process, though, Kane, w wouldn't you want to know why? Wouldn't you? Un I mean, that would burn because I thought I thought Simon Goodwin was the – just provided the greatest clarity when, when he said uh, – he just couldn't quite understand how it had landed the, the way that it did, given how the, the system, how it had been explained and how it had operated. And a rival coach with no dog in the fight is is sitting there perplexed. Mm, yeah, no, we're, we're perplexed by it. But if you're looking at what cost you the game, and I, I think you now now publicly it's become a big story. And the AFL are, are clearly you know, a, bit, a bit bemused as to why the carry-on has gone on for so long. Um, I, I would be focusing, yeah, yeah, of course you're aggrieved. He spoke about that at length after the game in his post-match media conference, and that was the platform to, for him to do that. He did that. You get the footy manager to get a clarification email from the AFL on Monday, but to still be wanting a, a detailed explanation a week on when there's so many other areas in that game that cost them, and perhaps Tom Lynch didn't actually kick the goal, I... Uh, <laughs> I don't know. It comes across petulant, and when you when you put in all the other areas that they've complained about and very trivial things in the past, it's a build up of events over time. Now that I don't think it's a great reflection of of the footy club.
What do you think of their list management strategy? So Cochin and Revolt to go on. They're clearly prepared to to trade a, a big heave yeah. of picks for Taranto and Hopper if they could uh, if they could land them both. Yeah, so I, I like the reset more than rebuild, and we touched on this last week. So the AFL industry is a copycat industry. Um, other clubs copy what has been successful at rival clubs, and I think a lot more are going to go down the Geelong path, more so than are going to go down the Adelaide or North Melbourne path where you cut deeply. So the reset is good. Um, it'll be interesting to see how the, the midfield dynamic works because I think what has been successful this year is real run and speed through your midfield. Geelong identified that they didn't have a lot of great runners in their midfield, so they go and added you know, elite runners. Sydney have done it through speed and class and ball use through their midfield. Melbourne have a big, strong, powerful, young you know, midfield in, in, in their prime. Fremantle is the same. So what does Richmond's midfield dynamic look like next year? What, what's it going to be? Cochin, Graham, Taranto, young players like Sonsi, but still in his second year is going to be a challenge for him. Bolton is is probably more of a forward than he is a midfielder. So, yeah, I think to to go with Trent Cochin again may be a bit of an elephant in the room for the next year because you don't want your champions to finish in the VFL and it's going to take a lot of managing of him because if you look at his second half matched up against Lockie Neal, um, I, I think Richmond were exposed through a bit of speed, and I'm not sure Tim Taranto helps. Good player, but he's not going to help um, with the speed through the midfield. So we'll wait and see you know, what that d- dynamic will look like. Do you think Taranto and Hopper would put them back in premiership contention? Uh, it'll help. Yeah, it, absolutely it will help because uh, they've still got you know Tom Lynch, arguably you know, one of the best key position forwards in the game, if not you know, top three. Uh, the back line is, is pretty solid. Yeah, so I think they're, they're they're well coached and they have a game plan. Don't know if they've got a list to win it, but I would have said the same thing about Geelong yep. last year. Um, so hard to make a call from the outside, but what you will say is the midfield was the issue for them. Hopper and Taranto addresses a, a giant need. Of course, the big talking point is Dustin Martin and and how invested he is in his football now from now on. Just as one one quick thought on the semis, would straight sets be a disaster for for both, for either? It would clearly be a disaster for Melbourne in a premiership defence. I'm not quite sure whether it would be the same disaster for Collingwood. More of a disaster for Melbourne than Collingwood, but still a disaster, I think. Uh, it's it's embarrassing going out in straight sets. I've done it. I've lived it. I've been there. Um, you'll be you know called chokers and, and those types of things. Firstly, I, I don't expect either of them to go out. I think they both should start absolute red-hot favourites. Yep. If Collingwood play the way they played against Geelong, against Melbourne, and they bring that defensive ferocity, and that, they'll just shut Fremantle. They won't be able to score Freo. So I expect them both to be reasonably one-sided. So I don't expect it to happen. But having lived through a straight sets exit um, at least once and some finals real disappointment, it, it is embarrassing. So more so of a disaster for Melbourne, Still a disaster for Collingwood, but I expect them both to win comfortably. Are you ready for your run? The run from <laughs> Adelaide to Melbourne for oh, my room for charity. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm as well prepared as I can be. I'm actually quite excited about it. It's going to be, you know, the, the, the support's been amazing. I've met some of these kids that are uh, dealing with the unimaginable at the moment and the heartbreak that their families are going through. So uh, they will absolutely inspire me. I leave on Sunday at about 7 o'clock from where I'm sitting right here, Studio Lumo uh, in Adelaide. Um, raised about $128,000 now. That money goes directly to kids and their families who have been affected by cancer through my room, which is an incredible charity. I'm looking forward to meeting a lot of people along the way and, and being inspired by some of their stories. So... Um, nervous, bit of trepidation, but a uh, little bit of excitement as well. Go well. We'll find the right time to talk to you next Thursday. Start well. Definitely do that. Good on you, Jared.